The world we are in is facing a multifaceted crisis, right? We have a health crisis, economic crisis, societal crisis, racial, environmental, ge geopolitical, you name it. And of course, the definition of madness is uh, doing the same thing and hoping for a better outcome. Hubert Jolie, former CEO of Best Buy, wrote this really good book. And you know, if I say something's a good book, I really, I really mean it. It's called The Heart of Business. The Heart of Business is the idea of pursuing a noble purpose, putting people at the center, and creating an environment that can unleash human magic, uh, embracing all stakeholders in some kind of declaration of interdependence, and treating profit as an outcome. Now, Michael, that's a simple formula. It's easy to say, really hard to do. And we know this because so many of us now on this uh, journey to reinvent business around purpose and humanity. And so the book is about providing, you know, the benefit of my experience and, and my work uh, and what it takes to, to do this, right? And it's around revisiting, I know we're going to talk about this, right? Revisiting the meaning of work revisiting what is the essence of a business, revisiting how we mobilize people and revisiting how we lead. And to quote Louis XVI during, you know, at the end of the 18th century, this is not a revolt, right? He asked one of his secretaries, uh, is this a revolt? And Monsieur de la Rochefoucauld said, no, sire, this is not a revolt, this is a revolution. You made a very provocative statement that implies business is not first and foremost about making money. I learned that from a client um, 30 years ago. So I was a partner at McKinsey and Company, and it was dinner with uh, the CEO of a major computer uh, information technology uh, uh, company. And he told me over dinner with two of my partners, you bear the purpose of a company is not to make money. Making money is an imperative, of course, and it's mainly a result, it's an outcome. And in business, he continued, there's three imperatives, and once I say it, you're gonna say, yeah, of course, it's obvious. You have the people imperative, meaning you need to have a, you know, good team members, properly trained and equipped. You have a business imperative, which is you need to have customers to whom you sell good products and services. And then you have a financial imperative, you need to make money. But then he said, it's truly the way it works, right? Excellence on the people imperative is what creates excellence on the business imperative, which then creates excellence on the financial imperative. But it says it's really important to not confuse an imperative and the purpose. And so then he gave a very practical illustration of this. He said, when you do a monthly business review with your team, don't start with financial results, end with financial results. If you start with financial results, you're probably going to spend the entire meeting um, on financials, and you won't have time for people and customers. Whereas if you start with people and business and end with finance, you'll have enough time to spend on finance because your CFO will make sure, but you'll focus on what really drives the outcome. And you therefore, ironically, it's by not focusing on financial results that you will get the best financial result. I think Best Buy is the living proof of that because we apply that philosophy and uh, I'll say that the share price of Best Buy went from a low of $11 in 2012 to now about $120, which I think in nine years doing times 11, I think it's okay, right, Michael? What happened at Best Buy and how did these principles inform your decision-making? Yes. Because I, I assume you had to make some really tough decisions at that time. So let's rewind to 2012. At that time, right, you'll remember this, Michael, everybody thought Best Buy was going to die. In fact, there was exactly zero buy recommendation uh, on, on the stock. And Amazon was going to kill us. Uh, you know, Apple and Microsoft opening their stores was going to kill us. Before I took the job, because I didn't need to take the job, let's be clear. I actually did some research. And what I found is two things. One is the world needed Best Buy, right? As customers... You know, when we buy these complex products, sometimes it's helpful to be able to go to the store and talk to somebody. And then importantly, the vendors needed Best Buy because they needed a place where to showcase the fruit of their billions of dollars of R&D investment. 
And the problem was essentially a series of issues that were self-inflicted. Like, you know, prices were not competitive. You know, the service was not great. The uh, uh, online experience was horrendous. And we know how important that is. Things like that. So, you know, if it's self-inflicted, Michael, of course, you can correct because it's in your control. Now, the advice I was getting at the time from many was cut, cut, cut. You know, the usual recipe of turnarounds, close stores, fire people, like if people would be the, the problem. So we did the opposite of that. We had a, even though we were going to die, we had, and because we were going to die, we had a very people and human centric approach to a turnaround. What do I mean by this? Let's be real concrete, right? Because everybody says people are the most important thing, right? So it started with people. It started with people, meaning listening to the frontliners. I spent my first week on the job, Michael, working in a store in a store in St. Cloud, Minnesota, listening to what the frontliners had to say. Because in a, in a company, that's where you get the truth, right? It's about what's working, what's not working. And they gave me pretty much 80% of what we needed to do. And then it was a matter of, doing it, because if I had just listened and done nothing, not a good outcome. It was also a people-centric approach because, so I have to admit, don't share this with Secretary McCarthy. Um, I'm not talking about the current leader of the House, but the old senator from the 50s. I'm a Maoist at heart. I believe fish rot from the head. So sometimes in a turnaround, the approach to change management is to change management, but it's about people, make, make sure you have the right people at, at, the, at the top. Then uh, it's people last. So it's people first because of this. It's people last in terms of you cut headcount as a last resort. I hate it when companies announce, you know, we're going to eliminate 10 or 20,000 jobs, stock price goes up. I think this is sickening. And so my approach to a turnaround, Michael, is number one, grow the revenue, right? It's amazing what revenue growth can do. Two, you're probably going to have to cut costs. And at Best Buy, we did have. Over eight years, we took $2 billion of cost out. But as you do this, focus first on what I call non-salary expenses, which is out of the element of the cost structures that have nothing to do with people. And at most companies, that's actually the vast majority of the cost structure. It's about eliminating waste, inefficiencies. And then you, you reduce headcount as a last resort. And each, as you do this, you're still being human because you're going to try to redeploy people within the company, or if you can't, then you're going to try to treat people on the way out as well as you treated them on the way in. And the last piece about the humanity of that first phase, which was the, the first three years of our journey, Renew Blue, was it's all about creating energy. We've been trained that, you know, as leaders, we need to be smart, come up with the best strategy, and that's, that's what's going to make a difference. I actually have a different view today. I believe that strategy is fine. But it's all about creating energy so that you can get things done. How do you do this? It's about co-creating the plan so that people own it. It's about getting going. It's about celebrating early wins. It's about talking about the problems. If there's problems, let's talk about them and let's handle them together. So it's people first, people last, and creating energy. What I find particularly interesting about what you just said is this combination of driving efficiency in a, in a very, it sounds like in a very intense way, however, combined equally with respect for the people and creating humanity. Yes. And you can, in, in fact, the source to efficiency is the human genius, right? <laughs> Even in tech companies, you know, who is behind the tech? It's people. And then we saw that even more, Michael, in the second phase of our, of our journey. So the turnaround was Renew Blue, so we'll call it from 2012 to 2016. And at some point, we decided that the turnaround was over and that we need to move to a growth phase where we would focus on building the best version of Best Buy we could. And that's where you know, we spend uh, more time defining our purpose as a company. And we spend more time also on creating the environments where we could unleash human magic. Because of course, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, many companies today talk about purpose, right? It's, it's become very, very fashionable. But then if you just state your purpose and nothing happens, you know, it's not exciting. So there's all of the work to go from thinking about the purpose to creating a situation where every employee can write themselves into that purpose. And, and, where, and that's when you see 
irrational levels of performance, which is essentially what we've seen at Best Buy. Let's talk about purpose for a moment. I we we do hear this term kind of popping up everywhere. And I think very often it's a good politically correct motherhood and apple pie kind of, you know, feels good, but there's no real substance. How do we what how do we convert that into something substantive and meaningful? Yeah. So let me make it really concrete and share some of the lessons learned along the way. And I'll tell you that uh, it, it was challenging. This was not a walk in the park. So as a result, we've learned a lot, <laughs> frankly, during that time. So back in, in 2016, um, as we were looking to accelerate our growth, we did the you know, good work around market research, segmentation, targeting, positioning, what I teach my students at Harvard Business School in the marketing uh, course. But then we also wanted to go beyond that and started to think about our why, right? Maybe influenced by Simon Sinek. So why do we exist, right? And that's where we came up with the concept of actually said it, we are not a retailer. We are not a retailer. We are a company that's in the business of enriching lives through technology by addressing key human needs. And defining your purpose. So I think you find a company purpose at the intersection between four circles, what the world needs, right? What are the human needs you're trying to address? What you're uniquely good at, what you're passionate about, and then of course, how you can make money. So this is real substance. This is not philanthropy. This is not CSR or ESG. This is a business discussion. But the benefit of thinking of defining the business in terms of its purpose is that number one, it vastly expands the addressable markets, right? And an a couple of examples of that, that's how at Best Buy we went into the healthcare space, helping aging seniors live and stay in their home independently longer by placing sensors you know, under their bed, under their, their, their sofa, in the kitchen, in the bathroom, fall detection. And so if you have aging people who have aging parents know what I'm talking about. You know, they live independently, but you want to keep an eye on them. And so with remote monitoring, artificial intelligence and care centers, you can actually really be helpful. And that's a service that's sold through insurance companies. We would never have thought about this if we had thought about ourselves as a retailer. The other example is this, uh, something I hope everybody will take advantage of, which is the in-home advisor program, where if your need is complex, you know, it's too complex to be handled in the, ho- in the, in the store or online, we'll actually come to you. And we'll become over, we'll aspire, if you let us, uh, to become over time like your CIO, your CTO for your home. And our homes are becoming more and more complex. So that's a, a real need. Again, you would not have done that as a retailer. And of course, the second thing it does, a noble purpose, it's inspiring for customers, right? Because in our heart as human beings, you know, we have a desire profoundly to do good things to other people, right? It's the golden rule. We want to contribute, make a difference, positive difference in, in the world. Now, again, if you just state, stay at the definition of the purpose, nothing happens. So the two examples I've given you show how you can make it a cornerstone of your strategy and come up with specific initiatives that support uh, that purpose. But then it's still not sufficient, right? Because it, you're not yet touching everybody <coughs> at, at, the, at the company. And uh, what you want is, uh, you know, at Best Buy, there's roughly 100,000 people. You want 100,000 people, including the blue shirts in the stores and whatnot, to write themselves into the story. And so here is the challenge, Michael. Let's imagine for a second that you and I walk into a Best Buy store. Uh, There's a few nearby where you live. And we're very excited. We're, we're, We're here to tell the store employees, we have some exciting news. We have a new corporate purpose as a company is to enrich lives through technology by addressing key human needs. What do you think would be the reaction of the store employees, right? They're going to say, you're saying what? You want me to do what at 10 a.m. when I take my <laughs> shift, right? It's like, uh, this is corporate speech, you bear. We love you, maybe. But, you know, you, you, you have to <laughs> do more work. And I give, and this was such a, an interesting journey because we, so this is what we did because we did not walk into the store like this. 
But we had 40 or 60 of our best leaders who knew the company really well, work on our brand identity and work on translating it into very concrete human terms. And it culminated into a training program that I thought was, I mean, I give them so much credit, right? So a Saturday in June, four years ago, we closed the stores for a few hours, all of the stores. And we assembled all of the staff. And of course, I was in one of the stores, no PowerPoint presentation, no video, nothing like this. We went into small groups and we did two things. We shared with each other our life story. So I was paired with a young woman. She had been in an abusive relationship with an ex-boyfriend. She had been homeless. And for her, Best Buy was really her home and, and her family. So, of course, Michael, all of a sudden, I see her not so much as an employee, but as a human being. And then the second exercise was share with each other, you know, the, the story of somebody in your life who's an inspiring friend and what they do to you to be an inspiring friend. So for me, it's my older brother, Philip. He's just a wonderful guy. I, I, you know, I love him. And then we said, okay, what we want to do, looking ahead, is actually what we do when we are our best today is we want to treat each other and our customers as human beings, not as walking wallets. And we want to be to each other and the customers an inspiring friend. Now, all of a sudden, I can write myself into that story, you know, irrespective of my job at the company. And I can find a personal connection with, between what drives me as a human being and my job and the purpose of the company. Now, of course, you, there's, it's a bit more complicated than does this. You also need to create the right environment. Maybe we'll talk about it. That we, we're on a sustainable basis, you know, you can unleash that human magic because we, I think we've all gone to training. It's all feeling good. But then if you go back to a, a poisonous environment, then that's not good. So you need then to work on the environment so that that's sustainable and that can be done uh, at scale. But uh, what's interesting in this approach, Michael, it's very different from the top-down, you know, approach to they, on my FBI most wanted list. There's two people. <laughs> One is Milton Friedman, you know, because we we're, we're you know, the idea of shareholder primacy, right? Everybody knows that, that he invented that in 1970. It was all about profits. That's poisonous. And then the other one is Bob McNamara, the former U.S. Secretary of Defense, who invented scientific top-down management where you take a bunch of smart people and they come up with a right uh, a smart strategy, they, then they tell other people what to do and they you know, make sure there's compliance. That doesn't work. Motivation is intrinsic and we need to have it come from within. And so that's where it's really a revolution. Let me ask you a very kind of practical question that comes from Wayne Anderson on Twitter. And he says, how do you square, quote, optimizing the cost of benefits, which is really, he says, a euphemism for reducing non-salary support for employees? How do you square that view of efficiency with this kind of humanity-led approach that you're describing? And especially, I'll add, especially at a public company where you're under such intense scrutiny, and you're kind of violating, in a way, the traditional norms of Milton Friedman-esque economics and philosophy. So Wayne is referring to, maybe he's an ex-Best ex Buy employee, which would be wonderful. The, if, if, you, if we make it a bit more granular in my hierarchy, so first grow revenue, two is go after non-salary expenses, the third one is indeed optimize benefits, and the fourth one, as a last resort, is uh, reduce headcount. So uh, with optimizing benefit, the best example I'd like to give is in the US, of course, most large companies are self-insured from a healthcare standpoint. If you can find ways to improve the health of your employees, this will reduce your healthcare cost. Okay? Uh, and so it's good for the employees because nobody wants to be sick, right? You want to be healthy. And it reduces the healthcare cost. So that's, that's a good case where it's, it's obviously a win-win case. 
Now, there's some cases where you, when the, 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 the times are really tough, where you're gonna, you, you may you know, reduce some of the benefits. And you do this, you know, that's a hierarchy. Uh, it's before reducing headcount, right? And so as an example, in my career, one of the things I've done is uh, sometimes, you know, vacations or paid time off, uh, it, at some companies, you could carry it over to the next year. If you change that policy and you say, no, you cannot carry it over. First of all, it's not entirely bad because it encourages people to take their time off, but it's actually a saving. Now, I'd rather have this saving if it can save a few jobs, right? So that's how I think about it. Now, to the Milton Friedman and to the debate with, so I hope it's helpful to Wayne and uh, you know, the, the, I'm not saying any of, this, any of this is easy, but that's the philosophy, right? It's a preference. It's a hierarchy of preferences. As relates to shareholders, in my philosophy, shareholders are a very important stakeholder, okay? And there are savings. You know, we give our savings to these financial institutions and they're there to optimize their performance. So they're really other human beings. And by the way, they share our concerns about the environment and about you know, really investing for the long term and so forth. My view of stakeholder capitalism or this view of, of the heart of business is not at the expense of shareholders. In fact, in many, many ways, uh, the way to maximize shareholder performance is by focusing on the noble purpose, on people, on embracing all stakeholders and to refuse. So I think other than the COVID disease, or pandemic, there's another pandemic in the world, which is the idea of zero sum game. Michael, the only way for you to win is if I lose. I think that's crazy. And so as leaders, and all of us are leaders because at the minimum we have the lead leaders of our lives, looking for ways to simultaneously uh, you know, serve the needs of our various stakeholders uh, is, the, is the approach. I'll give an example. You know, Amazon, right, was supposed to kill us. Well, what Best Buy has done is we've partnered with them. We're selling all of their products in our stores. And at some point, Amazon even gave us the exclusive rights to the Fire TV platform to be embedded in smart TVs. And Best Buy is the only place where you can actually get these TVs, either at Best Buy or by Best Buy on Amazon. So instead of being afraid of Amazon, um, you know, we found a, a way to partner. Same with Apple. Apple have got their own stores. We could see them as a competitor. We found ways to collaborate for the benefit of our customers, uh, for the benefit of the two companies, and therefore of our of our two shareholders. So I think that's our. We have to challenge ourselves to find win 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 solutions. Can we shift gear slightly? And let me ask you to put your your CEO hat on and tell us about customer experience and the role of customer experience and what it is and your thoughts on that topic. The resurgence of Best Buy is a very people-centric, employee-centric uh, story. It's also a very customer-centric story in two phases. Uh, in the first phase, the turnaround phase, we knew blue. It was about fixing what was broken. So we started measuring our net promoter score and we started looking at what were all of the uh, policies or practices we had that were causing some of the customers to be detractors. And so it's a pretty rud rudimentary approach, right? Where you look at, uh, at the list and you try, to, uh, try your best to identify the pain points and you work them one at a time. So it's a pain point elimination approach. It's reducing the pain. That was the first phase. In the second phase, we shifted gear. And believe me, we're still in the process of eliminating some pain points because you know, nobody is perfect here. But we shifted the mindset to more of how can we create happiness? So it's less about reducing the negative, but building the positive. And that's why it's really you know, related to the, to, the, the, to the purpose of truly understanding the underlying human needs of our customers and understanding what it would take to uh, create the best possible experience um, uh, in response to these customer needs. 
And so um, that would entail creating something that was not about fixing something that existed, but in many cases, inventing something that was completely new. Let me give you a couple of examples. I already mentioned the in-home advisor program. That was completely new. It's about you know, having a, you know, this relationship. So moving from selling products through transactions to selling solutions and building a relationship. The other one was uh, uh, support. Um, so as we have a lot of technology in our homes, you know, if Netflix is not working tonight, is it because of Netflix, the pipe into the home, so Comcast or Verizon or, or your, your local provider? Is it the router, the, the Wi-Fi, the TV, the streaming device? Honey, what is it? And of course, we've bought this, you know, it's, it's probably 10 different vendors. And so Best Buy can be honey, right? Because we're going to take care of everything in your home, irrespective of where you bought it. And that's what the customers want. They don't want to have to call 10 different, you know, providers. And then, so we're going to be at your backing call to take care of that. So in theory, that seems very straightforward. You know, we have to give the customer what they want, but in a large organization, what's the mechanism for understanding what those customer wants? And then very importantly, for feeding it back upstream so that you're designing the, the product in, a, in essence, in accordance with what, that, with what those customers are telling you. I think the two phases were a little bit different. Uh, to identify the pain points, again, net promoter score survey, or just, you know, yourself. I think one of the things I've learned is that uh, uh, when, when you're a leader, try to experience yourself what the customers are experiencing. So, Michael, that gave me a gigantic excuse to buy a lot of electronic products during my tenure right, at, uh, at the company, which was uh, so cool. And make sure that you experience it end to end. You don't delegate anything or you don't tell people you're the CEO. You want to experience it uh, end to end. In the second phase, which was more about creating happiness, I think that's where we invested in, in teams that had deep experience with you know, CX and UX, uh, you know, customer experience, user experience. And we went to creating these agile teams. So completely different approach. I think many, many companies now are on that journey. Uh, where you empower multifunctional teams to quickly create, you know, MVPs, minimum value, you know, viable uh, uh, solutions, uh, and and then try. So it's a completely different approach from, you know, the silo approach where we would uh, use that was years ago, right? So the uh, the waterfall approach. You 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 take months to gather the requirements, then years to develop a solution, and when you implement it, <laughs> the needs have changed, and so really creating this new way of working with expertise on customer experience and user experience design, but importantly, empowering multifunctional agile team to make decisions and try things and improve them uh, along the way. So that has allowed, uh, this is allowing many companies to move much faster. And I think during the COVID crisis, we've seen this huge acceleration of putting in place new approaches in support of uh, what the companies were trying to accomplish. What about from a cultural standpoint? So you've put these teams together, you've put the tools in place, you've provided the mandates and the incentives, but that doesn't mean that people's habits of how they think about customers and think about their departments and the silos, that's not going to just change. So what about that aspect? The agile teams sort of you know, challenge the silos, right? Because they're, they're, these agile teams are working together oftentimes in the same location and the challenge is not so much for the teams, but more for middle management because their role is really challenged. But more profoundly, I think this leads to the discussion of, you know, the ingredients uh, of, create, you know, what I call unleashing human magic. Uh, being originally from France, is that okay if I talk about ingredients and a recipe to unleash magic, right? And, and, and there's five that I think we've identified that uh, are really making a difference in our, you know, it's a little bit like the, the parable of the sower, right? If you, if you plant, and maybe that's your point, if you plant the seed, you know, in the rocks or in the bushes, it's not going to grow. So you need to have a fertile ground, good soil that's going to produce wonderful, you know, uh, trees or plants. And the five ingredients are what? One, it's about connecting dreams. And no, I've not been smoking anything illegal. 
what do I mean by connecting dream? I think magic happens if every one of us as individuals can connect, you know, what drives us, what our purpose in life is with our work and with the purpose of the, of the company. So I shared with you, you know, these training that we did in the, in the stores, that was a big deal. Another illustration of how you do this is this store general manager in Boston who would ask every one of the associates in the store, about 100 people, what is your dream? At Best Buy or outside of Best Buy, what is your dream? Okay, write it down in the break room. And then he would say, my job is to help you achieve your dream. And I think being, curious, being clear about what is our purpose as individuals, but being curious about the purpose of people around you as leaders, that's, a, that's not a silver bullet. There's no silver bullet, but that's a big deal. The second ingredient is creating and or enabling genuine, authentic human connections. And if, you, if, if we follow all of this idea of the, the, the purposeful human organization, human connections is really the essence of, uh, of our lives. And so how, what does that mean concretely? Yeah, the, 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 there's a, there's a store, the, the, in a store I was visiting, there was a young associate uh, who told me that his life changed the day a manager recognized him and took an interest in him. Right? And my uh, compatriot, the philosopher René Descartes of the Cartesian philosophy, right, logic, you know, famously said a few centuries ago, I think, therefore I am. I think he's wrong. For people, it's I am seen, therefore I am. So if we can create an environment where everyone around us feels seen and respected, and that you know, they can be vulnerable, they can say, I'm struggling with this, I need help. But my most frequently used phrase now as a leader is my name is Hubert and I, and I need help. And I think during this crisis, we've had many occasions where we say, felt that. I think it's important to say that the, the myth of the leader as the superhero, that's gone. The third ingredient is around autonomy. Guess why? Nobody likes to be told what to do. <laughs> Michael, do you like to be told what to do? I think my wife would agree with that one. <laughs> <laughs> None of us likes to be, we like, you know, intrinsic, motivation is, in, is intrinsic. So how can we create an environment where we empower our teams? And there's a lot of discussion around that, you know, in the, provided the, in, in the heart of business, which is like this guide to, you know, unleashing human magic. The fourth one is around mastery. People like to grow their skills. Now, that has significant implications from a leadership standpoint. Traditionally, leaders would look at results, especially in sales. Did you hit your quota? If I'm in sales, if I hit my quota, that's fine. If I did not, the fact that you're pointing out that I didn't hit it, do you think I'm stupid? I know I didn't hit it. Could you help me understand how I can get better? So focus on the drivers. And then the other key insight from our journey was it's one employee at a time. It's individualized coaching because our needs are different. And then the fifth ingredient is about growth, right? Life is about growth. So somehow as human beings, we have to grow and the, the organization has to grow because this is what life is about. That All of this sounds really soft, right? Two things. One, it's hard to do from personal experience, I know. And B, this is what creates irrationally good, surprisingly <laughs> delightful outcomes for stakeholders, including you know, shareholders. And so I, I've, you know, this has been such a wonderful learning journey for all of us and so exhilarating to create this environment where people have a spring in their step and they feel they can, you know, do great things for each other and for our customers. You know, the thing that really strikes me the most hearing you speak is I have this, the strong belief that you really mean it. You're a funny man. Yes, I do. <laughs> Very often, I think business leaders mouth these words, but again, it's a, it becomes a marketing veneer as opposed to, shall we say, a way of life with real substance behind it. Back to your first question. The reason why I wanted to write this book is because of the, again, surprisingly delightful success and, and resurgence of Best Buy, 
it gives me credibility and then the concrete examples of what it really means. Uh, and uh, of course, the conviction that this is this was huge in explaining the outcome. So to the extent that everybody now is on this journey of following a noble purpose and rediscovering our humanity, I, for me, it was very meaningful to be able to offer these tools and practical, ex practical examples. At the end of each chapter, there's a set of self-reflective -re questions uh, and, and one of the things is on our site, yes, that's a, that may be a, a resource for your for our listeners today, Michael. On my site, which is very simply uberjoli.org, so my first name, my last name, no dot dash or anything, just uberjoli.org, you'll find a, a business electrocardiogram, right, which is really an assessment tool to help you assess the health of the heart of your business identify the areas where, you know, you got some real strengths, right? You're really good at this. In other areas, maybe where there's opportunity. And of course, then there's a few suggestions around that. So that's my purpose is to help others, fellow travelers who are on this journey, uh, which I think is all of us. We're all on this journey. And I certainly don't have the corner on wisdom around this, but I wanted to share what I know. We have a couple of questions from Twitter. I'm just going to ask you to answer these quickly because unfortunately we're going to run out of time and people listening, like now is the time. It's your last call. If you want to ask a question, what a great opportunity. So first off from Prem, from at Prem underscore K. Prem says his son just has hit, had his first class on economics, business and entrepreneurship. What advice would you have for the young one? I think it's advice for all of us, Michael, uh, especially as we, you know, exit this pandemic and we, we're in this new era, right? I call it a new era because, you know, we need to, this is an era where we need to create a future that does not exist yet, but that needs to be better and more sustainable. And so the advice for all of us as leaders is, uh, you know, work on yourself, work on defining, you know, what is going to be your purpose in life? Right, a good friend of mine, John Donahoe, is the uh, CEO of Nike. He's a great man, so I'm doing some name dropping because I love him. <laughs> when he ended business school, he wrote down his retirement speech. Right, how he wanted to be remembered, and then he kept it and went back to it every year so that he could check in. Now, the advice to this young man is that uh, this is frankly hard to write your retirement speech. You know, at that age, I know because I have my kids and my students, it's a journey. But keep asking yourself this question of what's really meaningful to you, how you want to live your life, and then take care of yourself in that journey, right? And so check back in, meditate at the end of the day or of the week, revisit how you've lived your week. So, so it's really about being a purposeful leader and avoid making one of the mistakes I made in my life, which is for too many years, I had my head disconnected from the rest of my body. I thought that being smart was really essential. And it's okay to be smart. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think as leaders, uh, learning to lead with all of our body parts, our heads, but also our heart, our soul, our guts, our ears, our eyes, and uh, really learning to be a whole person, right? Not a businessman during the day and then a good human being you know, at the end of the day, we just won. We have another question from Twitter. And this is again from Wayne Anderson, who asks, he, he says, people are very diverse. How does a, how can a business have heart and identity while balancing the needs for employees to have space and develop their own personal identity? I think it's the heart of, of the matter. It's the heart of business. It's uh, creating that environment where every one of us can feel we belong in our full identity uh, and that we have enough space, that we have the autonomy, you know, to, uh, to do our thing. So that's the essence of this. And one of the convictions I have, Wayne, is that uh, here size doesn't matter paradoxically. Whether you are a 100-person organization or a million-person organization, it's the same because it's one team and one individual uh, at a time. The fact that Wayne is asking these questions gives me the sense that probably Wayne has some of the answers. So 
Uh, please, Wayne, share with us, you know, your your thoughts on this, because as I said, I don't have the corner on wisdom on, on, on any of that. And he actually comes back with yet another question. And he says, where does diversity fit in with the five points of unleashing human magic? It's a key element of human connection, right? Because it's one individual at a time. And so that's one element of diversity. But then you also have to look at systemic issues around gender and race. And as part of my journey, I've been a huge advocate, not just talking, but doing, on promoting gender and race uh, diversity. Uh, and so that's there, Wayne, because uh, that means all of us. How stupid would it be for a company to only recruit employees or leaders from one quarter of the population, people who look like uh, Michael and I, you know, aging white man? That'd be stupid. Nothing wrong with Michael, uh, but you know, I think it, if it had been, for example, Lehman Brothers than sisters, as opposed to Lehman Brothers, it would have been a better outcome. And, and race, of course, is a huge point. And I think uh, in this country, we finally realized how urgent and important it was to uh, do our best to end systemic racism. And I think companies are on that journey. So it's essential. It's not a sideshow. It's not something you do when you've done everything else. It's the essence of creating a magical organization in my book. So what advice do you have, again, putting on your, your CEO hat, what advice do you have to businesses who are who have just been struggling during this very difficult past year and are now thinking about the next steps? What should those folks do? People talk about a restart, we're gonna restart, reopen the economy. I think this is wrong. My view of what has happened in the last 12 to 15 months, it's analogous to when 66 million years ago, planet Earth was hit by an asteroid, which killed all of the dinosaurs. Now, of course, new species uh, emerged. And so as business leaders, now, of course, there's some of us like, you know, Zoom, you know, they're booming and so forth. But many of us, as you pointed out, Michael, you know, their top line has been hurt. And so for me, it's not a restart, it's a reset. And we have to, and many companies are doing this, right? They have to do three things. One is reimagine their business around this idea of purpose, right? So as to expand your addressable market. So if you're a hospital system like Mayo Clinic, don't think of yourself as a brick and mortar hospital system. Think about it as a company that's involved in health and wellness and with technology all of a sudden, through uh, teleconsultation and digital uh, surgery, you can actually address a much bigger uh, market. So reimagining your business around the human needs you're trying to address and leveraging technology. Two is refocus. The world has changed. The buying behaviors of customers have vastly changed. So look at where they are. Look at what's driving consumers around the circular economy, for example, uh, and adapt your positioning uh, accordingly. And the third one is reconfigure your business. We've seen a huge acceleration of technology penetration, certainly in retail, right, Michael? I think last quarter, Best Buy's share of online sales was 45%. You know, a year ago, it was half. And so you have to completely rethink all of the aspects of your value chain from how you uh, manage your workforce to how you manage your supply chain your customer experience and using technology, you know, quite, quite often really create a better uh, outcome for, for your customers and your employees and your shareholders. So it's a reset. That's the, that's the idea. Arsalan Khan, who's another regular listener, and thank you, Arsalan, as always, for participating, asks a great question. He says, how do you avoid the trap of the lowest hanging fruit? I think it depends a little bit on the circumstances. When I studied at Best Buy, where it was a matter of saving the company and fixing what was broken, going after the low-hanging fruit was actually a good idea because it could create the momentum uh, and the confidence that we could do this. Now, if you only go after the low-hanging fruit, and that's your only strategy, then I think uh, that, that it's not going to go as far as necessary. So then you have to step back and look at what's essential. And I'll, I'll share one uh, piece of advice I got when I was a, a CEO from 
uh, one of my new colleagues at Harvard, Frances Fry, who said, Hubert, and she, she was a marketing professor, she, she said, you're going to need to learn what you want to be bad at. And I said, Francis, you're kidding me. I, moi, I cannot be bad at anything. I don't want to be bad at anything. But she said, then, if you're going to be not focusing, if you're not going to decide what you're going to be bad at, it's going to be heroic mediocrity, right? You're going to try to do everything and, and nothing is going to be great. And so really through customer insight, um, identifying what's going to make the difference, right? What, are, what is this human need that you want to focus on? And what is it that you're completely, completely uh, uniquely able to do that you're going to do an amazing job of? And, and that's, that's, the, that's the mindset. As an example, uh, you know, Michael, you're wearing, uh, you know, Apple AirPods. <laughs> or they're wonderful. Apple is an amazing company. They are terrible at helping you with non-Apple products, right? And they're really focused on their ecosystem and so forth. So that's a great lesson for all of us, I think. And with that, I want to say a heartfelt thank you to Hubert Jolie. He is the author of The Heart of Business. And you know, if I hold a book up, it's not because I'm paid to do it. It's because I think it's a really good book. It's a, it's a really good book. So you should absolutely check it out. Hubert, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today. Well, thank you, Michael. And I did put all of my heart in that, uh, in that book. So I really hope it's helpful to, uh, to people. And uh, I so enjoyed our conversation, Michael. And, and the way you do this show is extraordinary. So thank you for you know, sharing your time with me. You're very kind. And I, and I want to say thank you, especially to all the people who watched, and in particular to the people who asked questions. Now, before you go, please subscribe to our newsletter. It's on the bottom of our screen. Check it out. And if you're watching on the CXO Talk site, hit the subscribe button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Do that. And also, you know, tell a friend. Everybody, we have great shows coming up. Check out CXOTalk.com and we will see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.